Welcome to the Crunch McDabble Show. I'm your host, Crunch McDabbles. This is the only show where we break down the Pathfinder rules into occasionally accurate chunks of knowledge. Today's show, Persistent Damage Part 2, The Deuce. We need to finish up Persistent Damage because we need to look at how the math works, and then we need to synthesize all of this to figure out our Persistent Damage strategy. So that's the show today. Here is what's great about Persistent Damage. If I give an enemy persistent damage in one round, on the next round, I could miss every single attack and still deal damage. And I might not even attack. I could do something else. I could do a heal check on someone and I could still deal damage. That's the beauty of persistent damage. And it's not just a small chance. Once someone has persistent damage, it's a really good chance that they're going to keep having it. And the coolest part, that is, it doesn't matter how tough the monster is, how high a level, how absolutely butch their saves are, every single thing, no matter how tough, has the same chance to get rid of it. A DC 15 flat check. That's it. 30% you get rid of it, 70% you still have it. And that's it. So what does this mean? Well, we need to get into the math on this. Now, all this math, it's not for everyone. And this is going to be a real snoozer, but we got to do it. We got to soldier through this because the math reveals a lot and it helps us with our strategy. So even if you're never going to break down the math yourself, which I don't blame you at all, it's uh, probably a testament to your sanity. If you don't, you can at least see the principles here and we'll look at some graphs and you can get a feel for the impact persistent damage is going to have on your damage. Let's say I'm a first level monk making tiger claw attacks. Yeah. They are going to deal a 1d4 bleed damage on a critical hit. So we want to know how much damage is this really? Like what does this translate to an average damage? And the thing is we can't just add a d4 of damage into our critical hit average damage because that would be inaccurate. And the reason it's inaccurate is because you can only get that damage one time in a round. It's exclusive. So if I hit multiple times in the same round with critical hits when I'm making Tiger Claw attacks, they're not going to deal a D4 of damage on each hit. So we can't put the bleed damage into our average damage because then that's what we'd be calculating and we don't want that. Instead, we're going to use the McDabble's Persistent Damage 3-Step. Yep, my grandma taught me the 2-Step. Now I'm going to teach you the McDabble's 3-Step. Step Step 1. Calculate the probability that the persistent damage will go off in the round. In our example of the Tiger Monk making four Tiger Claw attacks, we see there are four 5% chances that they will critically hit and deal that persistent bleed damage. Now, don't add these together. Instead, you have to invert them and multiply. Why do we invert them? Well, if we just calculate 5% times 5% times 5% times 5%, what we're actually calculating is the probability that you're going to critically hit four times in a row which is an incredibly small number, and that's not what we want at all. But if we invert it, and what does invert mean? When we invert something, we're just going to take 1 minus the percent expressed as a decimal. So 5% expressed as a decimal is 0.05. If we take 1 minus 0.05, we get 0.95. That's it. We've inverted it. Then we multiply these out now. So we take 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95, and we get 0.81. So what does 0.81 represent? That's the probability that you didn't critically hit at all, and therefore we didn't deal any persistent damage. So why do we want this number? Because when we invert it back, and invert again, 1 minus 0.81, now this new number is the probability that we didn't not critically hit, meaning that we did critically hit at least once. It's the probability that at least one of my attacks was a critical. And that's what we want to know. With persistent damage, it's either on or off. You either deal it or you didn't. It doesn't matter if you hit multiple times with it. Only one hit matters. So that's what we're trying to calculate. So we have to invert and multiply because inverting and multiplying tells us that binary, whether we hit or whether we did not hit with it. So now that we found the probability that we would deal persistent damage on these four attacks, that being 19%, we can calculate the average persistent damage for the round simply by taking 19% of the average persistent damage that you would deal. Since it's a D4, that's 2.5 average damage, 
and 19% of 2.5 is a whopping 0.5 average damage. And that's for the whole round. An extra 0.5 just gets added into the top of your average damage. Like that bright red little cherry dripping with sugary cherry syrup. It's not much. It's not nearly as good as the hot fudge sundae underneath it, but it looks, well, it looks red. And there's some contrast with the whipped cream and the chocolate sauce. It's nice. You want that cherry on there. But we aren't done, nerds, because something really crazy happens now. And we still have two more steps in this, so we can't be done. Bleed damage does something interesting in the next round and all the subsequent rounds. If you keep making your tiger claw attacks in the same way each round, each round you're still going to have that 19% chance to add persistent damage. But a huge Charles Barkley butt here. What happens if they already had the persistent damage from the previous round? Now all of a sudden, starting in round two, there are two ways they could have that persistent damage. You could hit them with it with a critical hit, or they could still have it from the previous round. So step two, we're gonna calculate the probability that they still have it from the previous turn. So grab the percent that they would have had the persistent damage from the previous round. In this case, it's 19%. So 19% of the time they would have had the persistent damage. And if they had the persistent damage, they would have had to make a DC 15 flat check at the end of their turn, which means of those 19%, 70% of them are still going to have the persistent damage in the next round. So we simply just multiply the 19% times the 70% and we get 13%. So 13% of the time when you go into round two, your target's already going to have that persistent damage. So that's step two. Step two is easy. And now we have an issue, though, because we have a chance they might already have it. And I'm going to keep hitting with my Tiger Claw attacks, still with that 19% chance I might critically hit. And we can't just add them together. Remember, you don't want to be that guy that does that. That would be too easy anyways. Instead, we go to McDabble. Step three. Step three, combine the probabilities. And this works the same as in step one, invert and multiply. That will tell us the probability that neither happens again. In this case, it's 13% from the previous round, 19% on this round. We invert these. We multiply them together. That tells us the probability that neither of these happens. And that's not what we want. We want the opposite of that. So we uh, invert it again. And boom, chaka taka. Boom, we get. Uh, and boom, chaka laka. You got 30%. Now, 30% in round two is great. That's up from 19% in round one. And the next round, when we get to step two again in this, we're going to use 30% instead of 19% from the previous round. And it means that each round, the probability of dealing that bleed damage, it's going to increase. How much does it increase? Let's look at some graphs. Here is that 19% tiger claw attack on the graph. You can see there is a steep spike in the first two rounds, pretty much doubling the probability by round three. But this always stabilizes and flattens. It's like a curve. It's those diminishing returns, that thing I don't understand at all, but apparently it happens in math. Other people seem to know what's going on here. But with the low initial probability, the curve is really steep. But as the initial probability increases, 30%, 40%, 50%, and on up, the curve flattens almost to a straight horizontal line, which is fine, really, because if you have a 90% chance to be to deal persistent damage, I mean, what more do you want? You want to get up to 97%? That's fine. But it's going to be a flat line. That's not a big increase. Now, what happens when you have persistent damage that doubles on a critical? In that case, you have two different probabilities. A probability that you hit and deal one amount of persistent damage and then a probability that you crit hit and deal another amount of persistent damage, usually doubled. So you can still only have one or the other or none, three options now. So I'm not quite sure if that changes the math. The way I would do it is just make two charts, one for the probability of a hit and one for the probability of a critical hit, and then run them separately. Calculate each one's average damage and add them together. Adding up, boy, you don't want to add. Let's look at an example of this and take a moment to breathe in this great swashbuckler attack. Look at this one. And thank you for pointing this one out. A ninth level swashbuckler doing a bleeding finisher against a flat footed target. I just made them flat footed just to change the armor class because they're probably doing some sort of um, 
a faint attack or something like that beforehand. It's a single action that deals 4d6 bleed damage on a hit, but a critical hit will double that to 8d6. That's ridiculous. Redonkulous. Ridiculous. So at level 8 versus a flat-footed armor class of 26, we are hitting 50% of the time and crit hitting 15% of the time. So we run the numbers for each one of these separately. 50% for a regular hit, and the damage for a regular hit is 4d6 for 14, and 15% for a critical hit, and the damage for the critical hit is double to 28 average damage, and then add these separately. Since they each have their own probability, I think this works, even though you can't have both occurring at the same time, but I still, I think the math takes care of that. It's either one or the other or none. So we take a probability of each and add it together. I think that works. We'll find out. So now that we have the math down on all this, let's, uh, well, at least better than last week. Let's say that. The wheels came off the bus last week. It was like sparks flying from under our bus as we were riding on the chassis. This brings us to the strategy. What did we learn about persistent damage by looking at the math? Well, we see that persistent damage is not a huge amount of damage, but even on a whopper attack like bleeding finisher, what persistent damage is, it's passive damage. That's the beauty. That's what we're trying to cultivate in our damage. We like passive damage. We can do things with that that are great. So how does this help our strategy? Strategy tip one, attack with the bleeding damage until they have it and then switch to a different attack if you can, attack that deals more damage. Then you benefit from the passive damage and you can start making better attacks. So that swashbuckler with the bleeding finisher, remember that bleeding finisher is just one attack per round pretty much. You can keep making that bleeding finisher each round until you deal that bleed damage and then start making multiple attacks while that target is trying to shake off their bleed damage. And alchemists, another great example of this, they can, deal persistent acid damage with their acid flask and then once they deal that acid damage then switch to some damage dealing bombs while that acid burns away at them or they can switch to a blight bomb after the acid bomb to try and get some persistent poison damage in there to stack with the persistent acid damage and then after that switch to the damage bombs another variation of this and this is not mcdavell's approved i'm going to mention it anyways spread that persistent damage around once you hit one target with persistent damage, move on to another target and hammer them with some sweet persistent damage. Then you could have multiple persistent damages going off all over the battlefield. And that could really stack up a lot of different damage, which could be cool. I'm a big believer of stacking damage on targets till they're gone. Do what you want with it. And strategy tip number two, have a variety of different persistent damages. And we saw this in video one. You can see there are a lot of ways to deal persistent damage. Try to have access to as many of these as you can, either individually or as a party. If everyone in the party is dealing the same kind of persistent damage, it's not going to stack, although it certainly would increase the likelihood that at least that one kind of persistent damage would be going on, and that still might be advantageous. But even a single character might have to consider their gear and feats to make sure they aren't hitting in a redundant type of persistent damage. So a rogue with a sweet wounding dagger and knife critical specialization effects on the dagger and bleeding debilitations, all that it might not work out great. It looks great, it sounds great, but it might not be ideal. But really the main reason to have a variety of persistent damages is because of this one factor, monster weaknesses. Weaknesses are gonna trigger with the persistent damage separately at the end of their turn, subjecting them to that weakness damage and extra time in the round. Now this could really mess with the monster. A troll trying to make that DC 15 flat check against persistent fire damage, even one point of persistent fire damage, it's gonna be really tricky for them. It's gonna put them in a panic. So again, having access to different sources is going to be really useful if you can target a monster with a particular weakness. And that is why you always recall knowledge. And that is it. I've been your host, Crunch McDabbles. This has been the Crunch McDabbles Show. Survive Galarian with some persistent damage. Part two.